Dr. Tom, Dr. Tom Cummings graduated from Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. He completed pathology residency and neuropathology fellowship at Duke University Medical Center. After fellowship, he joined the faculty of Duke and is now tenured professor of pathology and ophthalmology. He is director of the neuropathology and ophthalmic pathology divisions. He is the anatomic and clinical pathology residency program director and secretary for the Association of Pathology Chairs Program Directors Section Council. He is a member of the Vierhoff Zimmerman Ophthalmic Pathology Society and the Eastern Ophthalmic Pathology Society and has hosted both societies annual meeting at Duke. He has contributed to the World Health Organization Tumors of the Eye Blue Book. And he is honored to participate in the American Association of Neuropathologists Teaching Rounds. I will now turn it over to Dr. Cummings. Thank you, Dr. Oviedo, very much. Let's let me share a screen. All right, am I good? Yes, you're good. Yep. Okay, I have no financial relationships. And again, it's great to be with you all today. The learning objectives today are very simple. It's a view from the top of the world, uh, a very wide overlook of conjunctival and eyelid pathology. In ophthalmic pathology, we, we, at least when I lecture, I say the cornea is the window to the world. And now we're gonna see things more from the top of the world with the conjunctiva and eyelids. Of course, the cornea, where light first enters the eye must be completely clear no scarring, no vascularization to, to give you the best vision. So let's have some fun with some common and a few uncommon conjunctiva uh, lesions. Okay, so fundamentally to begin with, the conjunctiva is a mucous membrane. It is not skin. And therefore, as you know, as a residency program director, we need to teach CPT coding to our trainees. The CPT code for cornea and conjunctiva will be 88304. For the eyelid, which is skin, it'll be 88305. The conjunctiva has three main components. The palpebral, which lines the posterior surface of the eyelids. The epibulbar, which is the pericorneal surface of the anterior globe. And the fornix, the fornicial conjunctiva, which uh, in Latin fornix means arch, and that permits the freedom of the movement of the eyelids. And if you can see down here with my red pointer, I've got a P for the palpebral conjunctiva, an E for the epi or the bulbar conjunctiva, and an F for the fornix. And these are best seen. This of course is a section from an egg generation where you have full thickness eyelids and then the cornea and the globe. And it's really a great way to see all this uh, terrific anatomy of the eye. The conjunctiva is made of stratus, uh, stratified non-keratinizing squamous epithelium, and its main function, as I mentioned, was to permit the eyelids to move over the surface of the cornea without any damage to the cornea, the cornea being the window to the world. We need to protect it as much as we can. And as we will see in the next slide, the, the anatomy of the conjunctiva includes these very important goblet cells which are critical for producing the mucin layer of our, of our tear film. And I, I took this, this image from the National Eye Institute NIH website, and you don't really think of it, but every time you blink, what you're doing is you're replacing that tri-layered tear film that's protecting and nourishing the surface of your cornea. And it's a three layer. The outermost is the lipid layer made up, which uh, uh, derives from the lipid glands, the sebaceous glands in your tarsal plate in the eyelid that we'll see a bit later. The aqueous layer from your lacrimal gland to your glands. And finally, the mucin layer, which uh, derives from the, your mucus goblet cells of the conjunctiva. So the conjunctiva, these goblet cells are extremely important and if you've been following the news recently, you know there's a very uh, severe and tragic outbreak of blindness and even death from a uh, drug-resistant strain of Pseudomonas aeruginosa from contaminated eye drops. As you know, dry eye syndrome or dry eye disease is probably the leading ophthalmological 
uh, problem uh, on the planet. And, uh, and part of this problem is because your tear film layer is defective or deficient or non-functioning. And one way it can be non-functioning is if your mucin uh, goblet cell producing cells are not working correctly. So this is very important for our ocular health. Here's a, a basic photograph of conjunctiva. You see the epithelium here at the surface. The sclera is beneath the substantia or lamina propria, this loose fibrocollagenous fibrovascular connective tissue in between the two. And if you can see my red laser, you can see the goblet cells. And here on higher power, these very important goblet cells in our conjunctiva. Okay, there's a specialized component of conjunctiva called the caruncle. And this is a like a hybrid conjunctiva skin type tissue because on the surface it has conjunctival epithelium, but then in the stroma it has adnexal elements, including sebaceous glands, hair follicles, uh, stroma, melanocytes, striated muscle, and even some lacrimal gland tissue. The caruncle is this little rounded protuberance in the medial canthal uh, nasal type aspect of your eye. You can look at it next time you look at your eyes. Here in this individual, the caruncle is quite prominent and that's because we have some sebaceous gland hyperplasia with this dilated duct and a, a benign proliferation of sebaceous glands surrounding it. So the caruncle is conjunctiva, it's so-called specialized conjunctiva, and it is subject to a wide range of pathology that we would see elsewhere. This is another uh, classic lesion that you will typically find in the caruncle. It's called an oncocytoma, and it's just like oncocytomas elsewhere in the body. This brings up a, a good teaching point. Eye pathology, you don't have to, uh, you know, you don't have to uh, be too concerned about learning it because all of the pathology you see elsewhere in the body. So just by anatomic pathology training, you should be familiar with a lot of these diagnoses. In the caruncle, these uh, typically occur in, uh, in adult women. They have this red, uh, sometimes cherry red appearance. And histologically, they look like any other oncocytoma with this uh, bright pink mitochondrial rich cytoplasm and sometimes this cystic mucinous appearance. So another classic lesion, and uh, if you typically hear caruncular lesion, you should always have oncocytoma up there in your differential diagnosis, despite it being a small percent, 3% maybe of caruncular lesions. These tumors are thought to arise perhaps from accessory lacrimal glands in the caruncle. And here's another benign uh, image I had of uh, a caruncle with a nice patch of benign lacrimal gland tissue. Okay, let's give a, a view from the top of the world. Let's talk today about some congenital anomalies, especially the limbal dermoid, some degenerations of the conjunctiva, specifically pterygium, inflammatory and infectious processes. Herpes simplex is a good one to begin with. Neoplasia can involve the epithelium. We'll talk a little bit about squamous cell uh, neoplasia. Subepithelial lesions such as lymphoid tumors will occur. And of course, melanocytic lesions, which if you are a dermatopathologist or just from your training, you know that melanocytic lesions, no matter where they occur, are some of the most, can be some of our most challenging lesions. And the conjunctiva is no exception. These lesions uh, can be challenging. And then I will talk about a few others such as hereditary benign intraepithelial dyskeratosis. If you've never heard about hereditary benign intraepithelial dyskeratosis, I would highly recommend you, if I can put a plug here for our neuropathology fellowship, we have some openings in, in this upcoming July and the following July. And this, this disorder occurs almost exclusively in individuals who live here in North Carolina, and you'll be able to see these cases. Okay, so let's begin with the uh, congenital lesion, the so-called limbal dermoid. The, uh, first, let's describe the limbus. The limbus is this magical place 
the border between the cornea and the sclera. And it's where your ophthalmologist will surgically enter the eye to either phaco emulsify your cataract or do an intraocular procedure. And in usually young individuals, they might get this lesion, this yellow, whitish, hair, hair ridden lesion right on the border of the cornea and sclera. And this is the limbal dermoid. Now, be careful with this terminology. This is not a dermoid cyst that we think of elsewhere in the body, in the, in the ovary or you know, in the brain, when neuropathologists, we see these sometimes in the uh, cella tersica region and other places. Uh, so yeah, so just be careful of that terminology. The differential diagnosis is the, the splitting of the limbal dermoid into the so-called dermolipoma, where the stroma would be mostly adipose tissue. Here's the histology of the limbal dermoid. It's lined by epithelium. It looks almost like normal skin with that nexal structure, sebaceous glands, hair follicles, a little bit of subcutaneous fatty tissue down here. Imagine all of the subepithelium being filled with adipose tissue. I'd probably sign that as a dermo, sign that out as a dermal lipoma. And if I were to find some mesenchymal elements, some uh, such as cartilage or bone or lacrimal gland tissue, I'd call that a complex chorostoma. Chorostoma, you know, is benign tissue in a pretty much abnormal location, right? Think of your optic nerve chorostoma. You should not have uh, adipose tissue or smooth muscle in your optic nerve, but if you do, you would have a diagnosis called the optic nerve chorostoma. It's extremely rare. I've only seen one, seen one case. And here's another higher power magnification showing, of course, that next elements, some um, fibrocollagenous muscular tissue in the limbal dermoid. Okay, pinguiculum. If you, if you live in the South or in warm climates, just turn around to the person next to you at line wherever you shop, and you'll probably see these little yellow dot-like uh, accumulations in the sclera. This is a pinguiculum. It's simply a, an accumulation of actinic sun-type solar actinic damage. However, this, this actinic elastotic uh, formations can form in a wing-like manner and think of the Greek word tyron from which we get pterygium, which means wing, and you get this wing-like growth onto the surface of the cornea, which therefore is obstructive to vision and must be surgically excised. Here are just a few um, nice images I've got in my collection showing the, the gross histology, I'm sorry, the gross uh, image. As you know, ophthalmic and ophthalmology, and we benefit in ophthalmic pathology from seeing some really, really great photography of, of the diseases that affect the eye. Here is a uh, low magnification gross image of the pterygium. You see it almost looks like a wing, and it's just pterygia, it's uh, conjunctival epithelium and stroma. Here's some, uh, some hemorrhage during the procedure, iatrogenic. And then as we go down on higher power, you see this buildup of actinic elastotic fibers. And I can tell you, sometimes you get a big solid bound of actinic elastosis like I'm showing here. Other times you may see, you may really struggle to find some actinic fibers. You can do a, 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 an elastic stain, a Verhoff von Wiesen stain to bring out the elastic fibers. And there may be a wide range of elastosis. The pterygium, as we mentioned, is defined when the elastosis uh, infiltrates into the subepithelial stroma of the cornea. This, in contrast to the conjunctival epithelium, this just looks like corneal epithelium here with the basement membrane, maybe a little bit of Bowman's layer out here. And here's some actinic elastosis in the cornea stroma. Uh, one other degeneration that you might find in the conjunctiva, I've seen a few cases over the years, never count out amyloidosis. Okay, let's move on to inflammatory and infectious uh, disorders. I, I would like to give this interesting case presentation. This is an adult who was HIV positive and had pain and vision uh, loss in the left eye for two months. He has a history of 
acyclovir resistant herpes simplex virus skin lesions. And interestingly, he was diagnosed with herpes simplex keratitis involving the cornea as a child. And this is how the patient presented. You see this, this very angry bulbar conjunctiva, very red and inflamed and thickened, and also involving the, the um, I'm sorry, this is the uh, palpebral conj and the epibulbar conjunctiva, very, very inflamed, very irritated looking. At this point, we, got a, we received a biopsy. The clinical differential diagnosis, of course, included infectious lymphoma, papacies, squamous cell, and possibly retroorbital vascular uh, congestion. Here's one area of the, of the lesion. It's just a sheet of uh, lymphoid and plasmacytic inflammation with some acute inflammation in the epithelium. But then when you cruise around the epithelium, you see these multinucleated giant cells with the classic glassy appearance of a viral infection and some eosinophils down below. And these stains and these infected cells stained with herpes simplex virus immunohistochemistry. The patient was treated with foscovir, which is the indicated treatment for CMV retinitis and mucocutaneous acyclovir resistant herpes simplex. And at one point, the patient had uh, almost uh, 2200 vision, and afterwards his vision improved to 2060. So a, a nice success story there. Okay, just a few words about herpes simplex virus. Herpes is from the Latin, which means to creep, and it's a major cause of blindness in the world. This virus uh, lives uh, latently for the entire lifetime in the trigeminal ganglia. There are hundreds of thousands of cases that involve the eye just in the United States alone that can involve the cornea, the conjunctiva, the eyelid, and present with a stromal keratitis, an epithelial keratitis, and in our case, this severe conjunctivitis. So always be on the lookout for herpes. Okay, let's move on to, to neoplasia. Let's talk about squamous lesions of the conjunctiva. The uh, so-called cornea conjunctiva intraepithelial squamous neoplasia, and here the differential diagnosis you need to be familiar with is mucoepidermoid or adenosquamous carcinoma. If you are able to attend the USCAP, American Association of Ocular Oncologists and Pathology Companion Society meeting last week in New Orleans, we had some beautiful presentations. I was the moderator of the session. If you were there or you have access, please watch it. It will be a deep dive into CCIN and mucoepidermoid carcinoma, and also melanocytic lesions of the conjunctiva. Uh, I hope you have access to those lectures. They were, they were really ter uh, terrific. And here we will just be giving, as I said, like more of a view from the top of the world. And then as I mentioned, we'll talk about HBID and squamous papilloma. Here you can see a, an eye with this gelatinous, almost uh, thickening, with these sentinel blood vessels feeding the lesion. And this is really a classic appearance of ocular surface squamous neoplasia. When we talk about this lesion, like any other squamous lesion elsewhere in the, in the body that we'll see on our surgical pathology services, dysplasia can be mild, moderate, or severe. You can then progress to squamous cell carcinoma in situ, and finally invasive squamous cell carcinoma. And as you would imagine, they can all have different uh, presentations macroscopically. When you get these specimens, one of the key findings, you could almost think of it like a metastatic carcinoma to the brain. You get a sharp edge, a really uh, abrupt border. And here you can see normal benign conjunctival epithelium. And then with the tip of the arrow, you could, you could just about cut out the lesion, which is this uh, thickened and full thickness, this plastic lesion, which I would probably call squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Now we spoke about pterygia a few slides ago. Be careful of pterygia, five, 10, 15% of them will be associated with an epithelial lesion. So just don't go directly to the actinic elastosis and call it a pterygium and call it a day, but really uh, um, evaluate the epithelium 
you might see some thickening, you might see some dysplasia, you might see anything ranging up to carcinoma in situ or even an invasive squamous cell. The C, one of the seeds in CCIN is for the cornea, the other is for conjunctiva. And this was a case I had recently where the uh, dysplastic cells were involving the corneal epithelium. Here's one in mitosis. Here's Bowman's layer. So this is a fibrovascular panis between the basement membrane of the corneal epithelium and Bowman's layer as you're listing your many uh, diagnoses and abnormalities in your sign out. Okay, here's more of a classic squamous cell carcinoma in situ with thickening and uh, dysplasia full thickness and mitotic figures. Again, some clinical presentations. As you can tell, as, as you could probably predict, when the carcinoma becomes invasive, the macroscopic appearance is much more, uh, much more obvious and much more concerning. Here are a few cases I've had recently. Uh, clearly, and it just only can, continues to get worse. And sometimes these lesions can be uh, really destructive. Here, of course, is just some basic fundamental, fundamental histology with even the scarring of the stroma and these infiltrating squamous nests. This is a case you really might want to consider doing a mucin stain for adenosquamous mucoepidermoid carcinoma and rule that out. When these cases become invasive and invade into the stroma, they can actually invade into the eye. Here you see ciliary body epithelium. My pointer is going over the pigmented epithelium of the, the plicata of the ciliary body epithelium. And the squamous uh, tumor is just really infiltrating and completely surrounding the ciliary body. This is the optic nerve. Here's the, the dora, the meninges the dora with the right angle to the sclera. And you see the squamous cell carcinoma has invaded intraocularly along the, invaded into the, um, probably the choroid and the retina along the surface of the globe, all the way back to the optic nerve. And I have seen cases where it's actually gotten into the optic nerve and along the meninges. So don't, don't take squamous cell carcinoma with the conjunctiva lightly. It can be destructive and blinding and fat a fatal disease. Okay, let's talk about hereditary benign intraepithelial dyskeratosis. This is an individual with this whitish raised plaque-like lesion. You might say to me, wow, this kind of looks like the conjunctival squamous cell uh, lesion of the first, the first uh, gross photograph you showed. And I go, yes, that's true. HBID will definitely be in the differential diagnosis when you get these lesions. However, as pathologists, we know we always want the history. And if I tell you this individual is a member of the Halawasa Pony tribe in North Carolina, you would almost undoubtedly go right to HBID right at the top of your differential diagnosis. The, um, this is a, a tribe of Native Americans that live here in Northeast of North Carolina. Uh, if I walked out of Duke Hospital, where I am right now, and got in my car and drove up I-85 into Virginia and then into the Northeast to visit Dr. Martinez. Uh, I would go right through Halifax and Warren counties where these individuals live. I've, I've actually been there to visit them and they're, they're great people and they, they have this, these, um, these lesions which, are, which they need taken care of because they can affect vision, okay? On the, good, on the bright side, they're never malignant. However, they do recur. They can affect vision and they are frequently bilateral. Squamous cell cancers are rarely bilateral. However, it's never, you know, you never say always or never and there are cases of bilateral squamous cell tumors. So you've always got to have these in the differential diagnosis. Here again, a few more uh, clinical photographs. You see this very whitish uh, inflamed sentinel vessel enriched lesion growing onto the surface of the cornea. Here's another one. Some cases are uh, more severe than others. Whoops. And let's talk about the 
Uh, that slide you can just go back and review at your leisure if you want to. It's a very distinctive histology. It's a, a um, hyperkeratotic, acanthotic lesion, and this mantle of dyskeratotic squamous cells here into the top layer, individual very bright pink round cells, and then this almost Grenz zone layer of lymphoplasmacytic inflammation at the base. Higher magnification, see these bright red dyskeratotic cells within the epithelium. And again, the inflammatory uh, band at the base of the epithelium. All right. Squamous papilloma, again, has a very distinctive clinical appearance. It's eyepathology, think of it like neuropathology. You hear a, a lesion that is a ring-enhancing lesion by MRI, you immediately know your compact differential diagnosis. Same thing with ophthalmology. The, the clinicians frequently tell us the diagnosis. Here you can see this frond-like fibrovascular cords in the conjunctiva, at the limbus, onto the surface of the cornea, this is, you almost don't even need to do histology to know this is a papilloma. Here's another one. But of course we do histology because we wanna make sure it's not dysplastic or malignant. And here a very nice uh, appearance of the papilloma. Here's another more recent case I had. Remember this, this is our caruncle down here. And just above the caruncle, even involving the caruncle is this elevated nodule. And again, some goblet cell hyperplasia in the epithelium and the underlying stroma, just a classic uh, conjunctival squamous papilloma. I, I recommend if you haven't looked in your eyes for a while, you might want to give them a good look. If you flip up in your eyelid, you might see this salmon colored pinkish uh, patch. Again, this is, this is lymphoma till proven otherwise. It's a very distinct clinical appearance. There's nothing else like it. And when you get the biopsy, it's either gonna be a multi lymphoma or a mantle cell lymphoma. In the vast majority of the cases, your, your, uh, your B cell, you know, your low grade B cell lymphomas, your high grade B cell lymphomas will mainly involve the orbit if we're talking about ophthalmic pathology. And here's a cyclin D1. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the melanocytic lesions. These are, uh, just like any dermatopathologic uh, melanocytic lesion, these are challenging. They are not derm path identical because remember the conjunctiva is not skin, it's, it's a mucous membrane. We break them down into these four types. Melanosis, also known as complexion associated melanosis. If you are a, a deeper skinned colored individual, you will have a normal amount of melanosis in your conjunctiva. Freckles may occur in your conjunctiva, simple ethyls, okay? Then on to nevi, and then the, the other main topic is so-called conjunctival melanocytic intraepithelial neoplasia, also known as primary acquired melanosis. I think depending on which pathologist signs out your biopsy, you might see one or the other, or sometimes both diagnoses. The CMIN seems to be uh, more prominent now in the World Health Organization. I typically use both. And when you have a melanocytic proliferation, there's either no or mild atypia, minimal, moderate, or severe, and then advanced to melanoma in situ, and Worst case, of course, invasive malignant melanoma. This is a, a, a dark skinned individual. So this is a normal complexion associated melanosis. Now, this is important because when you receive a biopsy and it says pigmented conjunctival lesion, the first thing you need to ask is, is this a Caucasian or not? And if this is my conjunctiva, for example, if I wake up and I see this pigmented patch that is clearly abnormal, I might get a biopsy and that it needs to be evaluated for acquired melanosis with or without dysplasia. 
and then with you know either melanoma in situ or invasive melanoma. If this is a dark-skinned individual, this is essentially normal and unremarkable. Okay, cystic compound nevus. This is a, a, a once you've seen it, you know it type lesion. I don't know if there are too many other places in the world of pathology where you'll see exactly these findings. So I, I submitted a glass slide of this that we can review at the end. Right here's the caruncle. Here's this pigmented elevated uh, lesion. And the ophthalmologist can see cysts with their slit lamp exam when they examine these individuals. And here is the classic appearance. Pigmented melanocytes, cysts, and the cysts are lined by conjunctival epithelium, and there's some goblet cells, and this is your very basic conjunctival cystic compound nevus. It's compound because if you look up at the junction, you'll see involvement of the junction of the epithelium, and therefore it's a, a compound uh, nevus. Here again, higher magnification, showing these cysts that might fill up with some type fluid or secretions, the goblet cells lining the epithelium, and the pigmented nevus melanocytes in between. This is a uh, pigmentation here in the conjunctiva. In a light-skinned individual, a Caucasian, this is worrisome, and this will undoubtedly be an acquired melanosis. Here are just some more examples increasing in the severity of the clinical presentation. Uh, before I get to this, uh, melanosis can also be secondarily acquired from drugs and medications and maybe tattooing and other procedures. So always keep that in mind. This is from the recent uh, 2022 WHO classification. I applaud the WHO and the authors of this chapter for really uh, simplifying how we how we interpret these lesions now based on the cellularity and histologic features and the risk of progression to invasive melanoma. Again, if you if you were at the the USCAP Companion Society, this was uh, nicely discussed in detail. And I recommend next time you get a pigmented conjunctival lesion, you refer to this chart and it'll make your life simple. Here are some examples. I would call this acquired melanosis with mild atypia here at the base, maybe some mild cytologic atypia in the melanocytes. And then there's a spectrum between that and this lesion I'd probably call malignant melanoma in situ, where there's almost full thickness and uh, atypia. You may ask, can you misinterpret or confuse this with squamous cell carcinoma in situ, as we showed, as we showed earlier in the talk? And the answer is yes. And if you ever have doubt, please just do some immunohistochemistry. Not all melanocytic lesions will be pigmented. The lesion, the pigment might be difficult to find. And you can you can get fooled by a squamous proliferation. So ever in doubt, just use your immunohistochemistry. Here are some cases I had recently of a, uh, a very severe conjunctival melanoma. And again, these sentinel blood vessels of the conjunctiva are usually an ominous finding in any pathological process. Here is a, a whole mount of that case showing uh, malignant melanoma here. The epicenter was probably in the ciliary body extending out onto the conjunctiva and onto the surface of the globe. And look how it's really pushing the lens over. All right, let's do a few questions. You are more likely to receive a biopsy of hereditary benign intraepithelial dyskeratosis in which geographic location? And the answer of course is B, North Carolina. These individuals live right here in North Carolina. Next question, the limbal dermoid is histologically identical to a dermoid cyst, is a component of malignant teratoma, 
is a congenital chorostomatous lesion, frequently metastasizes or anatomically involves a superior lateral orbit. And of course, you know, the answer is C. It's a congenital chorostomatous lesion of epithelium, collagen, and epidermal appendages. It is benign and it does not involve the orbit. Okay, this was a reminder for me to show path presenter, but let's, let's move on for the moment. Uh, slide number one is the cystic compound uh, melanocytic nevus, and slide two is a slide of hereditary benign intraepithelial dyskeratosis. All right, let's try and get through some eyelid pathology. Hold on, let me get some water here. Everyone good with that overview of conjunctiva? Great, so let's move on to the eyelids. Simply the eyelids are skin and therefore that takes a CPT code of 88305. And it's essentially dermatopathology. Now I don't consider myself a dermatopathologist. I'm a very amateur dermatopathologist because I handle the eyelids that our ophthalmologists send in as specimens. Lucky for me, a, a good amount of eyelid dermatopathology is actinic keratosis, seborrheic keratosis, nevi, and other uh, so-called everyday uh, type dermatopathology that we can handle. As we mentioned earlier about the conjunctiva, posteriorly the eyelids are lined by the palpebral conjunctiva mucous membrane, and the eyelids working in conjunction with the conjunctiva are vital for corneal health and transparency and facial paralysis and failure to close the eyelids with resultant corneal ulceration can occur and will occur if you have damaged eyelids. This is a, an exoneration specimen, a whole mount slide that I scanned in. And the beauty of an orbital exoneration is it's really a, and I, uh, one of the best times you can really examine the anatomy of the full thickness eyelids. Okay, the full thickness lid, the palpebral conjunctiva, the fornix of the conjunctiva, then the epibulbar conjunctiva, and so on. Sometimes you will get a, the ophthalmologist or the oculoplastic surgeon will call this a wedge pentagonal excision. Often they will do this for eyelid lesions like basal cells and other tumors, even for a, chale a chalazion sometimes. And here what we're seeing is the skin right, probably the levator skeletal muscle here, some apocrine glands, some sweat glands, uh, the tarsal plate with your sebaceous glands, a sebaceous duct here, and then the palpebral conjunctival epithelium and subepithelial stroma with a little bit of chronic conjunctivitis. Okay, chalazion. This is a, 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 an epic ophthalmic uh, lesion. One of you in the crowd may have already had one in your lifetime. It's this raised inflamed uh, nodule on our eyelid. You might go to your, your eye doctor. They'll tell you put warm compresses. It usually gets better. What is it? It's a lipogranuloma. Imagine the sebaceous glands of your tarsal plate. They get plugged, they rupture, lipid extravasates into the, into the eyelid tissue and you get a lipid droplet or multiple lipid droplets surrounded by granulomatous and chronic inflammation. It's a classic uh, lipogranuloma. You don't need to do organism stains. You don't need to do anything else, okay? Here, sometimes you see the multinucleated cells uh, destroying the, the lipid or ingesting the, the lipid droplets, okay? Uh, one quick note about chalazia. The patient with the chronic recurrent chalazion, always beware of sebaceous carcinoma. That should always be right up there in your differential diagnosis of something you definitely don't want to miss. Okay, let's move on to sebaceous carcinoma because this is another, you know, another prime lesion for us as neuro and ophthalmic pathologists. Uh, here's a list of the main tumors you will see in the eyelid. The top four, uh, without doubt, top four basal cells, squamous cell, 
sebaceous, and then Merkel cell. Also in the eyelid, though, beware of the microcystic adnexal carcinoma, metastases to the eyelid, malignant melanoma, very rare in the eyelid, more common in the conjunctiva. Why that is, is I guess we can, we can discuss that. And then there's also this other exotic lesion. I've seen two or three cases over the years of signet ring cell histiocytoid carcinoma of the eyelid. Okay, so sebaceous carcinoma usually occurs in adults. And remember where you're, the anatomy of your sebaceous glands, meibomian glands in the tarsal plate, the Zeiss glands in your eyelash follicles, and others may occur in the caruncle, the conjunctiva, and rarely in the lacrimal gland. So you can get sebaceous carcinoma in unusual locations. How do these individuals present clinically? Matarosis, loss of the eyelashes. Also, they can present with an eyelid nodule that can resemble a chalazion, or with diffuse eyelid thickening and a persistent keratoconjunctivitis or blepharitis. It can also involve the caruncle, as we mentioned earlier. So always have sebaceous carcinoma up there on your differential diagnosis list. This is an individual. You see there are no eyelashes in the lower eyelid or even the upper eyelid. There's this thickening, just chronic uh, keratoconjunctivitis. Uh, conjunctivitis, blepharitis type appearance. Very distinctive. Notice the loss of eyelashes. Here's another individual. The eyelashes in the upper lid are preserved, but the bottom lid, they are lost. And again, the conjunctiva just looks inflamed. It looks like a conjunctivitis. And when you get the biopsy, you get this uh, combination of sebaceous type sebocyte, sebaceous cells with higher grade cells and mitotic figures. Again, beware, could this be a poorly differentiated basal cell or squamous cell or Merkel cell? Yes, and sometimes you need to do immunohistochemistry and, and tease these things out. Just like um, this comedo type necrosis pattern is very, uh, very well known in sebaceous tumors, like you might see in breast cancers. That's a good clue. Pagetoid intraepithelial spread also notoriously can happen in sebaceous carcinoma and is probably the reason for that eyelid thickening type uh, keratoconjunctivitis slash uh, blepharitis appearance. You see tumor cells just kind of percolating in and throughout the epithelium. Yeah, they can crawl down the adnexa and surround adnexal structures. So this tumor can do a lot of things. And here's a case I had recently where it metastasized to the lung. So you don't want to miss sebaceous cell because its biology and history of disease is much more severe compared to basal and squamous cell. Okay, sebaceous lesions, we can probably talk for the entire hour on these. I showed you a case of sebaceous hyperplasia earlier, sebaceous, sebacioma and sebaceous adenoma. Beware, of course, of the Muir-Torre syndrome, where you get a cutaneous sebaceous neoplasm and a visceral malignancy. Here's a case I had of the eyelid recently. Patient was evaluated, had colon cancer. Why is this a sebaceous adenoma? You see the sebaceous cells surrounded by bland, more benign type periphery of these uh, basal uh, type cells. Okay. Okay, another lesion. And in fact, uh, I just had another case come in last week of this. If you haven't heard of it, it's a good one to know. So-called granulomatous lymphangitis. Look at the thickening of the eyelid. Pronounced thickening of the eyelid, especially the upper eyelid. Upon biopsy, you see this granulomatous inflammation in the dermis. It's often perivascular inflammation. One outside case that I received in consult was misdiagnosed as sarcoidosis. The key finding is look in the lymphatics. You have multinucleated cells, inflammatory cells, lymphocytes. This is the key finding. Think of it like an intravascular large B cell type lymphoma. This is not lymphoma, this is inflammatory. These are. <clears throat> multinucleated cells and inflammatory cells within these lymphatics. 
There's a nice one, a nice granuloma within a lymphatic. And if you have any doubt, do a potoplane and D240 immunostain, and it'll light it right up. Okay. Another key finding to be aware of the so called Melkerson Rosenthal syndrome. These individuals need to be evaluated for facial paralysis, chronic edema of the face and lips and tongue hypertrophy and fissuring, the so-called lingua plicata. Okay, just a few more uh, top of the world eyelid pathology specimens you'll see. You might see these so-called actinic granulomas where the granulomatous inflammation is ingesting actinic fibers. I hope you can see that on the screen. It's usually much more evident under the scope. Sarcoidosis never counted out. Another classic lesion you may only see in ophthalmic pathology is the phacomatous chorostoma. This is a, an infant with this uh, thickening and swollen type appearance to the lower medial eyelid and face. Had a biopsy, had this dense fibrous type stromal tissue. And if you look within the, uh, the blue square here, you might see a little bit of epithelium, and a little bit of this pink material. This is intraocular lens type material. It's lens epithelium with lens fiber material. Vacomatous, vacoma means lens, of course. So this is abnormal lens, uh, intraocular lens material in an abnormal location being the eyelid. It gets hung up there embryologically and you end up with a vacomatous chorostoma. Okay, we're neuropathologists. We are well familiar with tuberous sclerosis. And somebody said to you, I have a patient with tuberous sclerosis with an eyelid lesion. I'm gonna take a biopsy and send it to you in neuropath. You'd go, great, it's probably an angiofibroma because that's what individuals with tuberous sclerosis uh, end up with. This is a case I had a few years ago. And it's this classic uh, vascularized fibrotic skin lesion, a little bit of uh, acanthosis maybe papillary type appearance, this uh, almost fibrotic appearance deep to the epithelium and increased vascularity throughout the deep stroma. Syringoma, another classic dermatopathology uh, diagnosis that often, not often, I see a few every, every year, but these bumps, multiple bumps along the eyelid and of course, the classic um, ductular type, you know, um, fish-like, tail-like structures within the within the dermis. Xanthelasma, cholesterol accumulation in the eyelids and the periocular skin. Sometimes we'll get biopsied or excised for cosmetic reasons. And what we see is, of course, a, a, a dense collection of foamy histiocytes in the dermis. They're frequently periadnexal. Of course, in these cases, you might have to worry about a histiocytic lesion. But like, like we mentioned, you, you know the clinical history and the clinical presentation, and you go from there. Neurofibromas uh, also frequently will occur within the eyelids and give this diffuse plexiform thickening within the eyelids. Here's a pretty severe case showing the, the signal change all throughout the, the uh, left upper eyelid. And of course, this, this group is well familiar with the plexiform neurofibroma. Okay, let's move on to question number three. When a patient presents with a recurrent or atypical chalazion, a biopsy is submitted to evaluate for and the answer, of course, is C, sebaceous carcinoma. Always beware of sebaceous carcinoma with uh, recurrent or atypical chalazion. Okay, and just a few more classic eyelid lesions, basal cell carcinoma, molluscum contagiosum, uh, viral infection of the eyelids. Do you see the pox virus infected cells? Seborrheic keratosis, very basic fundamental dermatopathology. Papillary hemangiomas. Again, nothing, nothing too diagnostically challenging, 
but you just need to be aware that all of these things can happen. The eccrine hydrocystoma, this translucent cystic lesion here in the lateral canthus of the eyelid with the classic double layered uh, epithelium forming a cyst. Okay, I've got maybe a few minutes. I can, I can run through this example of the signet ring histiocytoid uh, carcinoma. This is a, an individual patient I had. You can see the thickening, thickening of the eyelids. Here, more so probably the lower than the upper, although the upper looks a bit, a bit heavy. On imaging, you see the signal change throughout the upper and extending into the lower lid. This patient had a biopsy and the diagnosis was made. So you, you make this diagnosis knowing you're gonna get exoneration. So be careful when you make the diagnosis. Upper lid, lower lid, and all the, the globe and the orbital tissues. Here's a gross photograph showing this thickening of the upper lid, a little bit in the lower lid. Here's the lens. And here's the histology. And you can see these signet rings among these other bland uh, histiocytoid type looking cells. They often form single files like breast, uh, like breast lesions might. And on a biopsy, you might only see a sprinkling of cells. This is one biopsy I had. You can only count maybe 10 to 20 cells in here. You, you can't just ignore them and say, well, they're probably mast cells or some other inflammatory cell. Be careful. They may be the diagnostic cells. Here's a signet ring. Here's mucicarmine to prove they're mucin producing cells. They stain with cytokeratin, EMA, and ecadherin. Okay. KI67, it's low. They stain with uh, estrogen and progesterone receptors which again brings breast cancer into the differential diagnosis. The patient I showed you was a male, so you might not really have that high on your, on your list. Fish was negative for HER2 amplification and extensive metastatic workup was negative. And then a question came up, can you use hormonal therapy for estrogen progesterone positive tumors, uh, especially in the eyelid? And oncology got involved and um, essentially didn't think it was going to be beneficial in this case. Beware of other tumors with signet ring cells, such as, as neuropathologists. They are extremely rare, but ependymomas, oligodendrogliomas, and you've seen all the rest. Until you've seen a signet ring cell melanoma, you haven't really lived, I don't think. And, uh, and just be careful, okay? So the take-home points is these Primary signet ring or histocytoid carcinomas of the eyelid are aggressive tumors. They will metastasize. They can be fatal. They can histologically look very bland and very benign. So you must be aware of them and exclude metastases from breast, GI tract, or any other signet ring cell tumor. And these tumors can be skippy and patchy and just kind of percolate through the tissue. So be careful of small biopsies. And uh, if you don't know what a signet ring is, it was these, um, in the ancient world, it was a signature that you would put on a document or the door of a house or a tomb. It was an emblem of authority and it was put on a ring or worn around the neck and you can read all about it. But anyway, I'm running out of time. We've got five minutes left. I thank you for uh, joining us today. And if I can, I can go, let me see if I can new share and go to Path Presenter. Can you all see Path Presenter? Yes, yes, we can see it. Oh, great. So here's the hereditary benign intraepithelial dyskeratosis slide. Again, a massive acanthosis, thickening of the epithelium, a, a mantle at the surface of this hyperkeratotic dense pink round squamous cells that also involve deeper into the epithelium. And finally at the base, 
a layer, a sprinkling of a band-like, almost Grenz-like zone of chronic epithelium. And I think I got multiple examples of this. Here we go. So if you've never seen a case of hereditary benign intraepithelial dyskeratosis, this is a classic one. And again, be careful. Squamous cell, a squamous cell lesion might be in the differential diagnosis, but look how bland the epithelium is. And again, look for that mantle and dyskeratotic cells. Slide number one. is a classic example of a the compound cystic melanocytic nevus of the conjunctiva showing you the nevi among epithelial lined cystic structures and if you cruise around long enough you get lucky and you find a goblet cell Sometimes you'll see in, in any conjunctival biopsy or any specimen in the conjunctiva, you might see epithelial nests within the stroma. These are so-called pseudoglands of Henle. And remember, if you're uncertain as to where this, lead, this tissue is from, if you see goblet cells and you're somewhere around the eye, you can probably ascertain that it is, it is from, the, uh, from the conjunctiva. Here, maybe we're seeing a little bit of the the, uh, the junctional component of the nevus, and therefore it is a compound nevus. I'm looking at my clock here, it's 12.58. I think that's pretty good timing, maybe a minute or two if there's a question. And if not, I thank you all very much for joining today and learning a little bit ophthalmic pathology. I was gonna say, there is a, one question in the chat that maybe you can answer. Should I read it? It seems pretty straightforward. Well, okay. I don't know if it's straightforward or not, but it's short. Um, this is from Mohammed Harry. How do you differentiate between PAM without atypia and melanosis in an unknown race case? I would say that's almost impossible. You just need to know the race. Okay. And I think um, this is an example where, yes, you know, race matters when we're making these diagnoses. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't think we have time for other questions, I don't think. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you again for joining today's AAMP Teaching Rounds presentation. We would ask that you take a few minutes to complete a short evaluation. And completion helps ensure accurate reporting to the accreditation board. A link to the evaluation will appear on your PATH LMS screen upon the conclusion of the Zoom meeting, or you can navigate back to the main course and select the evaluation option. Once you have completed the evaluation and selected your credit amount, please then select the appropriate certificate based on your credentials. The PowerPoint slides and recordings will be posted to the AAMP website within the next week. And thank you again to Dr. Cummings for an excellent presentation. This concludes the session for today. Thank you. And real quick, if anyone wants to email me, please do. Thank you. Bye, everybody.